So our hot topic today is support for students and alumni in the job search right now. Um, and this, we sort of developed this after our last hot topic in March based on the discussion that we had with all of you um, when we were uh, wrapping up and some of the things that you're curious about. So the right now part really focuses on what's happening in um, the world of employment, uh, what the direction that UD is headed in, in terms of uh, recruiting, which we don't have a lot of answers for that, but we'll get to that. And then how do we, how are we approaching the job search with our students? So we're gonna talk about the college recruiting landscape and then the job search process and advising. And then we've got three case studies that we can, we're a small enough group that we can um, talk about these after you've seen the material that I'm gonna go ahead and present. So I'm going to turn it over to Jason. Um, he's going to talk about the college recruiting landscape. And Jason, just ping me when you're ready for me to advance. Very good. Well, um, Liz, thank you. And uh, welcome to all of our career champions. And we know it's the lunch hour. So by all means, feel free to take care of yourself during this hour, eat lunch, sit outside, whatever it feels appropriate to you. Um, and I would be remiss without wishing our friend and colleague, Laura Cotton Hall, a very happy 40th birthday. Uh, Laura, happy birthday. Wish we were in the same room, but it's uh, a blessing to have you during this presentation. Thank you very much. So we can go to the next slide, Liz. So, you know, ultimately, all of us are uh, affected by the unemployment rate, including college students and recent graduates, and we have seen some improvement. So, um, we tend to hear about the unemployment rate about a month after the fact as the Department of Labor is collecting information from around the country, and the national unemployment rate dipped um, in March to 6%. And in fact, there were over 900,000 jobs created uh, in the economy last month. So certainly some good signs of rebounding. I really like this chart, which um, I, I did acquire from the Department of Labor. I didn't actually plot this out myself, but nonetheless, it takes a really good look at the unemployment rate by month from 2005 all the way through the end of 2020. We ended 2020 at a 6.7% unemployment rate, and it's gotten slightly better down to 6% as of last month. Um, it's remarkable on a historic level how much the unemployment rate changed during the pandemic. Immediately before the pandemic, we had such a strong economy in terms of employment. If you look at February of 2020, that number is below 4%, which is historic in terms of how low that number was. It quickly skyrocketed to almost 15% um, dur during that real spike of the pandemic and then has been slowly coming down month by month. Um, but it's amazing to me how much worse the employment situation was in our country during the pandemic um, even compared to how challenging things were during the Great Recession of roughly 07 to 2010. Um, and, and in fact, there, there's a question in the chat from, from Lisa about um, undergrads. In fact, we do have some data on that. In fact, Liz, would you mind going to the next slide? Um, so thank you for that preview, um, Lise, because this takes a look, um, not the exact same period of time, but this looks 2011 through 2021. In fact, this data does go into March. And the unemployment rate for college grads, now they're defining this as a bachelor's degree or higher. So bachelor's degree, master's, law, PhD, and the like. Um, the rate in March was 3.7% for someone with a college degree, once again, bachelor's degree or higher, uh, compared to 6.7% for someone who had completed a high school diploma. Now, normally, when you look at unemployment rate trends, the higher the person um, has completed a degree, um, she or he, the higher, highest degree completed, typically the lower the unemployment rate. So typically the unemployment rate for someone that has a, a doctorate is typically around 1%. Now we can debate this um, and we can debate how many people with PhDs are working in the academy versus an in industry. 
nonetheless, um, typically higher degree attainment does chart with lower unemployment. Um, now, this chart does not take into account underemployment or how many college grads are working in their desired industry or field of choice. Nonetheless, things are getting a little bit better for college grads, and you can kind of take a look um, with the, the blue line being those that did not complete high school, uh, the light blue, those who completed high school but no additional training, uh, the red line for those who went to college for a period of time or completed perhaps a two-year degree or a trade program. And then that um, kind of orangish brown line um, is for the bachelor's degree or higher. And this chart comes from the Department of Labor. Uh, next slide, please, Liz. So we take a look at a couple of national associations in terms of giving us information about what is the current landscape like for our own college students. My favorite is the Collegiate Employment Research Institute, which is located at Michigan State University and led by economist Dr. Phil Gardner. Uh, Philip releases recruiting trends typically right before Thanksgiving. So this report would have been the data contributed uh, through surveys by employers all over the country, large and small, public and private. He has a really large data set for his report. And they were asked, these employers, will you be hiring more, fewer, or the same number of college graduates for the class of 21 compared to the class of 20? And um, in November, they told Dr. Gardner that overall hiring would be down by 2% for the class of 21 compared to the class of 20. Um, bachelor's level hiring only, so BA, BS mostly, um, was forecast to be down by 1%. Um, if anyone works with, with MBA students, the MBA hiring numbers were a little further down. Uh, you know, they were projected to be down by more than 5% compared to the previous year. And associate's degree hiring um, is actually up more than 10%. And if you think about the pandemic, a lot of the roles that were in high demand in terms of um, medical roles, technician roles, a lot of those require a two-year degree, and therefore there's been a lot of hiring in that sector. Um, so that was kind of the snapshot in November. And with the next slide, if you don't mind, Liz, we're taking a look at NACE. Um, NACE is an association that UD belongs to. It's the National Association of Colleges and Employers. Many of you know NACE. And NACE conducts a job outlook surveying employers, a slightly smaller sample, but nonetheless a large sample. In the fall, in the green text, the employers in the fall uh, projected a decrease in hiring, uh, basically of a, a, a flat level, a decrease of 0.1%. Um, those same employers responded to an update survey in February and March. And I think as the pandemic has slowly um, started to recede, um, employers in the spring actually project hiring 7.2% more new college grads from the class of 21 compared to the class of 20. I don't think NACE's survey is better than Dr. Gardner's, but I do think this survey being conducted in the spring when the vaccine has been released reflects some hope um, and some hope that we have for, for our current uh, graduating seniors. Next slide, please, Liz. By the way, we are a very small group today, so please feel free to, to chat questions or to come off mute. Uh, we're happy to make this a conversation. Um, we are optimistic um, in terms of the prospects for graduating seniors. Now we're not where we were two or three years ago. We're not at that 3.7% unemployment from uh, before the pandemic, but we are hopeful. We're also hopeful regarding what's gonna happen around here in the fall. Um, we, you know, we have a plan and a date for in-person events like the large fall career and internship fair on campus, which we hope to have again in the RecPlex. We're still awaiting permission to do that from the university, from public health in Montgomery County in the city of Dayton, but we're certainly hopeful. Um, now we may have to be flexible. If you think about our career fairs, 
and a lot of you have walked through them, you're talking about a gym that has 200 tables, um, you know, with something like 500 employers and well over 1,200, 1,400 students coming through as job seekers. Are we going to feel comfortable being in a room that tight when right now going to CVS or Kroger feels like, like a big step for a lot of us. So I don't know the answer to that. And we might have some hybrid events where we do some smaller fairs and some online things, but we're certainly hopeful uh, regarding the fall semester and, and having re recruiters come back to campus. We have seen a rebound in terms of employer activity and handshake, and I don't have a percent to share, but um, certainly postings are up this semester, whereas for the fall semester, they were flat to down just a little bit year to year. Now, recruiting is entirely virtual right now for us. Um, so all students are, are interviewing largely through video. Um, not that some aren't going on site, especially in technical areas or perhaps in, um, you know, for teachers going to meet schools. Uh, but a lot of recruiting is done um, really through virtual means and a lot of video recruiting experiences. The success rate for the class of 2020 from the first destination survey was 93% measured at six months. Um, we're hopeful we will hit that mark or even um, exceed it for the class of 21, but time will tell and certainly we'll have more sessions on that as time move, moves forward. So I think I'm gonna tag Liz for the next uh, topic this afternoon. Although I certainly welcome any reactions, questions or observations about what you're seeing uh, working you know, with, with current seniors and, and current students who are set to graduate from graduate school. One comment that I, met, I had meant to mention from the last slide there's been a pretty consistent level of interest in graduate school. And that certainly was the case during the pandemic as well. Um, typically between 24 and 26% of undergrads from UD go immediately to a professional or a graduate degree program as their primary first step beyond the university. And for the class of 2020, that was right at 25%. Um, typically, during a recession, we see pretty strong interest in graduate school. Now, we can debate whether or not that that's a good thing, um, but I would expect that to be the case again this year. And that's what I've seen, and I'm, I'm guessing others who are on this call, um, Liz, Laura, who work with a lot of seniors going to grad school, there's been a lot of interest in students applying to grad school, um, either for great reasons or based upon the perception that the economy is, is difficult right now. All right. Any questions for Jason before I transition to the job search process? Okay. So the second part of our presentation is just helping you understand what happens in a career advising appointment when a student says, I need help with my job search. And the framework for the strategy is, it, for me in particular, usually remains the same, but the goal is to tailor the discussion and the resources according to what the student's career field and interests are. Uh, the strategy that I provide always works for students looking for both internships and full-time positions. And then over the course of this past year, there are these, these minor tweaks and adjustments because of COVID. Um, Primarily, our mantra, we have two mantras, which is that that um, that per really be persistent, but also we're really telling our students you have to be flexible in your job search. You may have some things in mind, but it's okay to be a bit flexible when it comes to this first job out of undergraduate because we are in an unprecedented type of situation. In order to tailor the job search strategy, you have to get some information from your student first. So if they come to you and say, hey, just talk to me about my job search a little bit. You know, some of the first questions are, well, what are you looking for? Um, and secondly, where do you think that you want to live? Um, if the student is just starting the job search, 
um, they, they may not quite be able to answer these questions or they may be like refusing to answer these questions and they've just sort of jumped into the job search. When I ask that question, what type of positions are you looking for? In my language, I call them job targets. You can say anything, positions, occupations, job targets, really whatever works best for you. But the challenge is, is if they don't know what they're looking for and they don't know where they wanna live, that makes for a very unfocused job search. And it also makes for a very discouraged student. So we have a certain number of students that are going to come to you or come to us, and they may have two to four occupations and industries and a few geographic regions that they can identify. Well, this is excellent and makes all of our jobs easier as an advisor because we know right away, let's jump into the strategy and do some brainstorming and connect you to those resources because we're going to get them to match your goals. However, there's also a good percentage of students that will give you the, I don't know, I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything. And what I gently do is point out to the student that if they're using the job boards, which initially when they come to us or they come to you for um, some help, that's usually about the only thing they're doing is the job boards because it's just what they know. And if they're not using any kind of search criteria or filters on occupation and location, well, that job board is going to return tens of thousands of postings. And I'll say that to the student, go ahead and pull up a job board and don't put it, just go, I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything and see how many jobs that you have to filter through. And this is where our students hit that, I'm overwhelmed and I'm frustrated with the job search, um, which means they, they just, some of them just will back off and not engage with the process. So it's, I usually tell them, listen, to know how to job search is not innate. You have to ask for some help and understand that there is a way to, uh, to approach this in an organized fashion so that you're gonna be successful. So it's not something that we expect you to know, we expect you to ask some help from us. So the first part of your conversation is what are your job targets and where is it that you want to live? Um, and well, the student is, they might be ready to get the job search started. If they can't answer those questions, you actually have to back up into the career development process again. And we do, we cover the career development process in our level one training. A lot of you here today have been through that. So it really is defaulting back to, we have to examine what your skills, your interests, your values, and your personality traits are, and let me connect you to what can I do with this major, ONET, the Occupational Outlook Handbook. Um, I've taken seniors all the way back into a career assessment at this level sometimes. If they're, they really just have a difficult time identifying anything, um, it's, it's okay to pull in a career assessment. I kind of like the, the Myers-Briggs type indicator for seniors. It's based on personality. It kind of brings a different light to their career planning. And I think that the MBTI is really appropriate for a more mature student. But focus and strong do just, just as well. But I, I like MBTI for our more advanced students. The other thing that I start suggesting is that even if they have an inkling of an industry or an interest, if they just start reviewing job postings. And I'm telling you, some of them, they're, I don't want to look at job postings. Okay, I'm not telling you you have to apply for them right now. I'm just telling you start reviewing them and seeing, does it sound like something that I want to do? Does it match some of my goals that I've set for myself or some of the things I've already done in undergraduate? And start to take note in terms of what lights up, what resonates, what stands out to them, because they're going to start to uncover some of those occupations keywords and skills that they need to start applying and running good searches. So that's that career development process if they have no job targets or occupations to work with. The other thing is geography. Again, if you just say, I'll go anywhere, that can kind of create a very messy job search. And I, I will push this issue, even if they're dead set on, I don't care as long as it's not home or as long as it's not Dayton, I just want to go someplace else. I revert to where do you not want to live and work? And as we all know, asking students what they don't want or what they don't like is a much easier question to answer than what they, they do like. 
And what you'll they'll discover right away is there is a pretty decent handful of places that they just absolutely don't want to work or live. If I say, if you hate the snow and the cold and long winters, don't move to North Dakota, but you're kind of opening yourself up, no offense to North Dakota, but you're opening yourself up to, to kind of going someplace that might not be a very good point uh, place for you. The other question I ask is think about where do you have a support network? Where do you have some family? Where do you have some friends that's outside of where you kind of want to get away from? That also brings some cities and some locations or even just a region into the conversation that can be really helpful. And then the last thing I advise them to do is consider the cost of living because they really do need to do some research through Chamber of Commerce sites or the Riley Guide about if I decide that I'm gonna to move to New York City, which is very exciting, uh, my paycheck, even though there's an adjustment for cost of living all across the country, that, that paycheck is not gonna go nearly as far. It's gonna be a very handsome looking salary, but it's all gonna to go to rent and your transportation. And sometimes they don't realize that cost of living, especially in major metropolitan areas, is gonna eat up a lot of their salary, even though it looks like they're, um, uh, earning a very handsome income. So these types of questions will start to narrow down the geography. And you know what? Sometimes I get, I don't care anywhere in the Southeast. Well, that's better than nothing to help them drill down because you can pull a whole handful of cities to work with in the Southeast that will focus that job search just a little bit more. So those are the two important questions to lay the foundation for tailoring the job search strategy. When we get into the job search strategy, whoops, we it, it comes in three parts. It's working with the job boards, creating what, again, this is my language, a target list, and doing your networking. And I'm going to go over each one of those um, in the order that I like to present them. So the bread and butter here for our students are the job boards. If you say to them, tell me about your job search. What have you done so far? And what are what resources are you using? And that's actually a very common question in our office, especially if they have their job targets and their geography nailed down. And they might be struggling in the job search. I'll say, well, tell me about the resources. I, I will lay bets that nine out of 10 students will say, I'm using job boards. And nine out of 10 students, when I say which ones, are going to say LinkedIn. LinkedIn has probably eclipsed every other job board that is out there uh, in terms of the resources that our students are using. So I try to, I always tell them, get a variety of job boards under your belt. It doesn't have to be a ton of them. It just has to be a nice little tidy handful. So again, th these are my references. Of course, I have to recommend Handshake because we use Handshake. Um, and students may push back a little bit in terms of Handshake and say, well, there it's not gonna pull positions geographically for where I wanna be. And I have to inform them that's, that's not true. Handshake is utilized. Now, last statistic we heard, and Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, is over 900 schools nationally are using the Handshake platform. I'll bet that's up to 1,000 now. Would you agree? I, absolutely. In fact, you talk to schools almost every month who are either considering or have moved to Handshake. Yeah. So the, the, the nice thing about Handshake is if if DePaul University in Chicago is using the Handshake platform and an employer is posting a position at DePaul, they're gonna get pinged by the system to say, hey, all of these other schools are using Handshake. Would you like to also post your position with these other schools? They can click off on all the schools or they can regionally pick what they like. That means that our students have more access to positions from across the country than they actually sort of think that they do. So you have to help them work on that perception a little bit when it comes to Handshake. But I also like ZipRecruiter and Glassdoor, um, primarily because I think they pull in a decent number of um, good entry-level positions um, or positions that just require maybe a year's worth of experience through internship and that type of thing. It's a good resource for our students who are just graduating. And they do a really good job with internships as well. 
when we're doing job searching, I also recommend industry specific um, job boards, maybe one add to the mix. And I'm actually gonna change my, I'm gonna do a new screen share because I wanna show you how to find these. Um, let's see. All right, bear with me for a second while I get a browser open. I just need my hand, my Zoom window to go away, which it's not going away. Okay, fine, don't go away. Liz, while you're adjusting, um, Handshake had a press release. There, they, there are now more than 1,100 colleges and universities that use Handshake, and I uh, put, put a link to that information in our Zoom chat. Oh, that's wonderful, thank you. Okay, so uh, can you see career services? Yes. Okay, so student tab, and you have seen this resource before, but I, I am a person who is, if we ever get rid of this, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm so dependent under the choosing a major or career tab with the what can I do with this major? Because not only do I use it for helping our students discern their major, but I use it actually quite a bit for job searching. So I'm gonna click on view all majors. And I'm going to go to probably one of my favorites, which is advertising. We have lots of students interested in marketing and that type of thing. And when you click on the resource, remember, you've got area of world of work, types of employers and strategies. But at the very bottom, other additional resources, their professional associations, et cetera, employment opportunities. And this is where students can find websites that are very specifically related to the industries that they're pursuing. So Talent Zoo is a, pre oh, oh, okay. Better not move around too much or I'm gonna get completely disconnected. Um, <laughs> but ta trust me, Talent Zoo is alive and well. I think I'm having some internet connectivity issues at the moment that happens. That's been happening to me um, on and off for a couple of weeks. But that gives the student a very industry specific job site to augment all the really big boards that they're working with. Um, all right, I'm gonna go back to my presentation. Okay, are we back to the presentation? Okay, thank you. All right, so some of the, the tips that we want to um, provide to our students is they need some strategies for using the job boards because remember they get real stuck in I'm only using the job boards so we have to have a conversation about how to run effective searches um, so one of the things that I recommend is they continue to research the occupations and the job postings that they're interested in because what it does is it helps them learn the language of the industry it also helps them understand what do the job titles look like so that they can build strong keyword searches. This is always in development. You know, is it a marketing coordinator, um, a program coordinator? Is it a data analyst? What is it? What are the common terms, keywords that are coming up so that you're gonna be able to do some decent filtering and pull the right kind of jobs to you? The other thing I recommend is manage your time efficiently and effectively. Job boards and using them are a great bit. You can start on a Sunday afternoon at 1.30 and look up and all of a sudden it's four o'clock and you're like, what, what happened to all my time? So when I'm advising students on how to budget their job search time that they have in between classes and everything else, they really do need to limit their time that they spend on job boards. If it's two to three hours a week when they hit that three hour mark, they need to leave the strategy and move into the next strategy, which is their um, target list. That's really important because even if you're being extremely productive on job boards, you have to know when you hit a plateau. And I had a very nice alumni give me that phrasing. He came in, he said, I'm looking for a new job and I think I've hit a plateau with the job boards. And I was like, that's a great way to describe it. What happens is you start your job search with the boards, you're getting yay new positions, you're seeing lots of new positions. And then all of a sudden you just start to see the same thing over and over again. So now you're at the mercy of the job board to post something and you're just waiting for things to appear. That can be really discouraging to a job searcher. So that's when you know you've hit your time limit. You're not gonna stop using the job boards, but you're gonna move into your next strategy where you're gonna be able to take a little bit more control of your search. 
And this is when I move students into what's called the target list. Honestly, this is my language. You could just say it's a list of organizations in which you would like to pursue a job or a career. A list of organizations where you think you want to work. So you can keep it really simple. The trick is, is you have to put a little bit of work and some elbow grease into developing that target list. And according to what your interest, your goals, your occupations in your geographic region is, that's what's actually going to build the target list. So students and I do a lot of brainstorming when we get into this uh, phase. So how do you help a student build a target list? Well, first of all, if they already know what their industry is, go ahead and start talking about those industries and start doing some searches. So if it is advertising, um, they, I wanna work for an advertising agency. All right, you're gonna do a list, the top 25 advertising agencies in Chicago, the top 25 advertising agencies in Cincinnati, which they always look at me like I'm crazy, but what they don't know is that Cincinnati has a ton of advertising agencies in the region because it's home to a whole bunch of corporate headquarters. So that industry kind of grew up around all those corporate headquarters. Columbus, not so much in terms of the advertising space, but Chicago, Cincinnati, great places to look for advertising positions. Now, what are we gonna tell our students in terms of how industry and business has been affected in terms of COVID? So what we do, and we're still doing it, is we advise our students to pay attention to those industries that are thriving during COVID. That can be healthcare, logistics and supply chain, information technology. If you're not a software programmer, advise them to think about all the other business functions that fall under an IT company, human resources, sales, finance, accounting, all of that there are jo jobs to be had. Home construction, um, retail, no, not going and working, bagging groceries, but go look for a job at Kroger, corporate, they're hiring. So think grocery, home improvement, um, e-commerce is doing extremely well and will continue to. Online education, insurance, consumer packaged goods. So our Procter & Gamble's, um, our Unilever, those types of companies, uh, SC Johnson. Um, the federal government is, is doing fairly well, biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies. These are some of those industries that are thriving um, right now within COVID. If you have students who are interested in industries that have not been thriving in COVID, this is where we have that you really have to be flexible conversation. For now, you may have to put off entering that industry or that particular sector until your next job change, which would come maybe within one to three years. So that's see how things are going. We also advise students to really pay attention to the projections of how long it will take certain industries to recover because they're talking about that from an, from an economy standpoint of how long it'll take some of our industries to really find themselves again. The ones that really took a hit, arts, sports, and entertainment, the nonprofits are really struggling. Where the federal government is doing well, state and local governments are struggling a bit and not doing a lot of hiring. Hospitality, and I hate to say it, but media and marketing um, are also struggling, although we're, we are seeing marketing come back to a certain extent. When talking about the job search during COVID, we also advise them to think even beyond that list that I just gave you. So the questions that we pose to them is, which industries are essential during COVID? That's question number one. Question number two is during the pandemic, where have we not managed ourselves well? So these are industries and sectors that will try to do an evaluation of, gosh, we didn't do so well. Where can we improve our operations, our processes? Because there, there's some future opportunities embedded in that question that they need to pay attention to. Um, if the student is still struggling to figure out what job targets to pursue or which industries um, um, make up these job targets and where they can find them, I actually send them back to that, what can I do with this major tool? Because if they look at the areas of the world of work under each um, major, and they look at the types of employers, that actually gives them some ideas on how to build their target list. All right, 
if the job target exists in every industry, like I want to be a software programmer. Okay, every company is hiring software programmers. Or I'm an engineer um, and I, every manufacturing company out there is hiring engineers. Um, I'll tell them to kind of work a little bit with their geography. So depending on the cities that they're target, targeting, do some research and determine what the, the business personality of the region is. So I just mentioned that Cincinnati, you would never know that Cincinnati has a whole lot of advertising agencies. That makes up part of their business personality. Um, the other fact is if you do some general searching for top 25 or top 50 employers in the region, you're gonna pull all those corporate headquarters to you. You're gonna start to learn what the key industries are within that geographic region. I also suggest doing searches for fastest growing companies because of course they're gonna be doing some hiring. But don't forget about small businesses. You know, 100 employees or less, there are also some nuggets of some really good jobs out there um, that can be sourced. So don't forget about the small businesses when you're building that target list. Any questions about that? Okay, let's talk about the third strategy which is networking. Now I very intentionally present in this order, job boards, target board, tar target list, networking, because here's the thing, the target list informs where to begin networking. Now we all know this, 60 to 70% of jobs are never posted online and our students really have to be doing some networking. Okay, so, if you've brainstormed the target list, then you tell them your target list informs where you're going to be doing your networking. Um, some students are already, they've got this down. So when you ask them, tell me about your job search. I've had some students surprise me, like they're not even using the job boards. They're just networking um, and they're doing it hardcore. And that's amazing. You don't need to have the discussion about networking with them. They have got this completely under control but there's a small percentage of students who are really, really comfortable in this space. So you almost have to do a networking 101 talk with them in the advising appointment. Um, so again, if they're like, I LinkedIn networking, I, I, you've talked to me about it. I've gone to a couple of workshops, but I still have no idea what I'm doing. Um, if they're feeling shy, just tell them to start with the people that they know. Do that first, do some connecting, do some networking with family, friends, um, parents of friends, old pro former professors and supervisors, just to get them going. And, and do that on LinkedIn, as well as making some phone calls and catching up with people. Because of COVID, we have been networking virtually since last year. Now we were always using social media and LinkedIn, but it became almost our sole way of getting our networking done. But I also advise students, you need to be ready to do some in-person networking when we can go back to functioning in person. Don't forget that that's going to be part of your whole repertoire of the networking that you're doing. So they, again, they need a really quick LinkedIn 101 type of session. So I will literally pull up LinkedIn and take a peek at their profile, give them some advice on how to improve it. We will talk to them about how to use the alumni search tool because if they have a company on their target list that looks really attractive and they might wanna network with a few UD alumni that could potentially work with that company, use the alumni search tool to see if they can find some folks that are working within that organization. Um, just, just some gentle advising on how to ask to connect. Don't just say, hey, can I connect with you? Send a message, give some context tips on how to nurture their relationships and be active on LinkedIn, which is just be active with your profile, like some things, offer congratulations to people who get new jobs and are having work anniversaries, or be even more active, create a post, do a video, include a blog. All of this is going to help them um, nurture that network. And as they're job searching, once they've established their connection, there's nothing wrong to reaching out to an alumni or even a cold contact that they were able to connect with. Remember, they've never come right out and asked anybody for a job, but to eventually say, hey, I noticed that um, there's a program coordinator uh, posting uh, for your company available right now. 
could you just take a few, could we just take a few minutes and maybe have a quick chat through Zoom and maybe you could just give me a little bit of additional information about your company. Again, not asking for the job or an inside track, just can, can you just chat and let me learn a little bit more about the company. You never know where that's going to take you. This is where students kind of back away from networking a little bit because this is the long game, right? But what they don't realize is the long game in networking is usually where they unearth those 60 to 80% of jobs that are never posted. So if you're having this conversation with a sophomore who's looking for an internship, that's actually a good time to be having the conversation with them. If they're a senior, well, it's never too late to have a conversation with a senior about anything. So just dive in and have the conversation. The other thing that we talk about is uh, additional networking strategies. Um, attend virtual conferences right now. They're so much less expensive and they are good ways to network with people. Um, also do some other types of networking events um, that are outside of LinkedIn and conferences. Look at um, Eventbrite. Oh, I have a typo that should say Eventbrite. I'm so sorry. But Eventbrite is a place where you can search for all different types of networking and events going on. Young professional organizations within each city um, are doing some virtual networking and just look at local chamber of commerces. That will also give you some ideas um, about where you can be doing some virtual networking for right now and eventually find some in-person events. Jason, is there anything else about networking that I forgot or you wanna add? No, I, I think you've done a very nice job summarizing it, Liz. And I think I, I liked how you talked about earlier how you were presenting, you know, job boards along with networking. And um, we all know on this call that people find their jobs through networking, but that can sometimes be a hard place to jump in with the students. Um, so sometimes I, I like to talk about how we combine resources. So take a look at the job postings you'll find in Handshake or maybe on a big board like Indeed, and then go into LinkedIn and see, hey, are there any flyers who are there? Or is there anybody connected to my own network who, who might know someone who knows something about that organization? Great, thank you. So any questions before we do a little discussion? Okay. So our first, I called this case study for discussion. And, and actually we took some of your questions from our March session and built them into this, this time for us to talk about this. So now you've got, you've got some tools in your toolbox for job search strategy and you have a student that you advise come to you and they say it's mid April and I've decided that I would like to get a summer internship. Is it too late to start looking? Are all the internships gone? So what, what say you? <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree with Jerika's post in the chat that it, it's a question that we get a few times a week, if not a few times a day. And this makes up like the bulk of our advising appointments right now. So this is a question I get from my DC flyers a lot too, especially this year. Most of them would have been placed by now, but I think just over half of them have placements because places are slower this year. Yeah. So I would say, I would, I would say, no, I don't think all the internships are gone, but you need to get on the ball and start. <laughs> You need to get serious. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would be, um, that's my first comment. Um, determine what you're looking for and figure that out fast. <laughs> so, yeah. And maybe use ZipRecruiter and Glassdoor since those are good for internships. Those are really good for internships, yes. I asked them if they've, if they've even looked at Handshake to see if there's any jobs posted on Handshake. Um, at least for engineering students, a lot of them have had to take the co-op seminar or the EGR 200. And so I know Nancy sends out a list very frequently of open positions and handshake. And so I asked them if they've seen that list and they always tell me no. <laughs> which, which is why they need you to say, have you even started with handshake? Yeah, have you even started with handshake? 
Um, do you have a resume that you could even use to apply for jobs today? I kind of gauge where they are. And if it sounds like they could start applying today, I encourage them to go and look and handshake or um, Indeed is one that I've, I've had students get success off of to just start, start looking. Um, and students often come to me because they think I have like a magic bag of internships that I can like tell them they can have. And I have to crush their spirits and say, no, you, you gotta go and look. Every now and then we get reached out to, but I'll, I'll keep you in mind if I hear about something, but you've got to go and do the work. And, and Tarika, you make two really good points, especially like industry specific, specific. So engineering, sometimes those students have the perception that all the jobs were secured back in the fall, because that's when employers are really active for both co-op and internship. But here's the thing, it, that's, it, that's true, but the middle of April, you, there's still a job to be found that you could start the 1st of June if you hit it really hard, rest of April and all of May. Just because your engineering and all the hiring typically traditionally happens in the fall doesn't mean that there are still opportunities out there because there really are. So that... That's the so as you're crushing their spirit just a little bit and going now you got to put the elbow grease into the job search, <laughs> but it's not too late. Yeah, I think this year, and of course we can say this year is different about everything in our lives, our personal lives, our work lives. But I think there are employers who said no, we can't host an intern, and then now they're reconsidering. So we might see a continued rush of late postings for internships and co-ops as employers feel a little more comfortable in light of vaccine numbers. Yeah. One of the other questions that I, I always ask students at this point, um, when they say they're looking, they want a summer internship, I ask them what's their energy level to, to search for an internship? Ooh. Because coming up at the end of the semester, if you don't have the energy to give to the search, then are you open to fall opportunities? Are you open to co-oping? Uh, here's some things you can do over the summer to be ready for the fall career fair and, and job search process. And I've had some students say, yeah, I, I, I'm not <laughs> gonna do that. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, then let's, let's plan ahead for hitting it hard in the fall. Yeah, that, that's such an excellent question. And I've actually even transferred that into our seniors who are about to graduate, who are real stressed about that first full-time job. And sometimes I'll say to them, listen, what, what does it look like when you leave here? Can you go home? Do you have a soft, secure place to land while you job search over the summer? Do you just need to focus on the business of graduating? And about half will say, I really just need to get through the academics. And they sometimes need one of us to say, it's okay that you're not job searching right away. Graduate, take four or five days off and then get started. It, it really, it's okay. They do land with jobs by the end of the summer. Any other comments on discussion number one? And I'll go on to number two. I just had a, a question about university policy. Can we recommend students to do internship um, experiences that are in person right now? I know my DC flyers all have to be virtual or they have to file a waiver if they think they can get to DC on their own since travel was suspended. Laura, I think because you're doing a university sponsored program, you have to have that criteria and that waiver in place. But, but remember, because internships for the most part for like non-sponsored programs aren't required on campus. They, they can do whatever they want to do. Very good, so thank you. They can do remote or they can do in person because there's so many internships being secured out there that are sort of unbeknownst to us. Outside of my EXP and COP courses, I, they're out there working remotely, but some are in person. That sounds like a terrible answer. <laughs> like I'm not looking out for their safety. <laughs> you know, but it's interesting because there's safety and then there's employment prospects for a year from now. So both are, both are really 
important considerations. Yeah. Well, and what we're finding with DC Flyers is that, especially on Capitol Hill, they're going back to in-person. So the fact that we can only offer virtual internships is not working for a lot of students. They're having to re- re-envision what they want their DC experience to look like. Mm-hmm. All right, so, so bottom line, no, all the internships are not gone. No, it's not too late. Figure out what you want, figure it out quickly. Bring in a high degree of flexibility in your search, get organized and apply to as many positions as possible. And you could have a nice little internship by June. Technical difficulties. <laughs> okay. A young alumni graduate one to three, graduated one to three years ago, reaches out to you for help with job search strategy. The alum is unhappy with their career field and is thinking about making a career change. I'll start um, for this one. So with Flyer Connection, our mentoring platform and um, mentor and networking platform, this is actually one of the help topics that an alum can mark on their profile that they are willing to talk with a student or an alum about. The topic is, you know, I'm an expert in career changing or making a career change. Um, so when I have um, an, a young alum or even the occasional student that will reach out about this, I point them and walk them through how they can search um, Flyer Connection for that. And I also tell them about the resources available and career services, but make sure they take advantage of that one. That, that is awesome. I, I love the legs that Flyer Connection is starting to, to gain. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? I have had a few students or alumni reach out with this question. And normally we, we just schedule a meeting and have a conversation, but I always ask them if they've, if they even know what they want to make their career change to, because a lot of times they just don't like the job that they're in and they don't really know what they would want to do different. And um, so just having that conversation, asking them if, if they've talked to career services, because I, I, I know a little bit enough to be dangerous, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, you know, if they, if they don't know and they don't know where to start, then I encourage them to, to talk to someone else. But if they have an idea of what they want to do, I encourage them to start looking not to feel like they're obligated to stay with the company that they're at or in the industry that they're in, that they should feel empowered to look and to the same process they use to apply for jobs at the beginning, they can use that same process. Um, and the great thing is they don't have to worry about GPA. Right. <laughs> you don't, right. There's so many things you don't have to worry about anymore. Um, now that you've got some experience under your belt, that could be helpful. Yeah. And Jerika, that's such an important question because you're right. A lot of times they they don't even know why they're not happy because they because now they're working full time. Life has sort of carried them away and to work and all these responsibilities, and they haven't sat down long enough to reflect. Well, why do I want to make a change, and what is it that I want to change into? So that's that's typically where we start as well. And sometimes we uncover that they're really not all that unhappy with the job. It might be that particular company and they just need to switch companies. They need a new boss. Uh, that happens as well. So it's, it's alumni are very complex. I don't care if they've been out for a year or if they've been out for 40 years. They, they are very complex advising um, spaces that we get into. We have about two minutes left. Anyone else? Okay, so for this one, um, 
it's as you know, it's always triaging, you know, wh what are the problems in the career development process and what are the challenges in the job search? And some of the things that we uncover are un unrealistic expectations about their about how their career should be um, progressing and their perception of levels of happiness and finding passion and purpose, um, or they're not putting enough effort into the job. Like they know what they want, but I've applied for 10 jobs over three months and no one will call me. Well, you need to apply for a hundred jobs during, like you really need to, to put a little bit more effort into it. A reluctance to network is, a, is another one. Poor networking gets such a bad rap, but people are very afraid of it. And I, <laughs> part of me understands that, but part of me is like, come on now. Um, and they didn't really learn how to job search. Maybe they got their first job very easily right out of undergrad through net. Maybe it was networking and they didn't realize it or the career fair or were on a job board and quickly something evolved. So they need a lesson in the, the basics of job searching. So those are some of the typical problems that we bump up against. Any other questions?